good morning. Good to see you all. Uh, for those who joined us last night, welcome back. I hope you enjoyed viewing the drones. Um, if you missed them, you can check out our Twitter page. We have a, a few pictures of them. It was very exciting. Uh, again, thank you to Dr. Uh, Stephen Morris for providing them from the MLB company. Um, my name is Robert Garcia. I am the senior symposium editor of the Stanford Law Review for volume 64. Uh, thank you for coming again. Uh, I would like to thank our co-sponsor, the Stanford Center for Internet and Society. We could not have done it without them. They're listed up there. Uh, and also to Ryan Kahlo, who is not here, but he is our resident privacy expert, um, and he's also with CIS. Um, to those who came last night, sorry, you're going to hear a lot of this again. Um, but we're excited for this symposium. Uh, privacy is clearly in the media. It's on the, the, uh, the it, it's a topic of discussion. It's ripe for discussion. So we hope that uh, the panels today and the keynote will provide an engaging debate. Um, and I want to just talk briefly about our articles. So we decided to do something different this year. Rather than publish a print symposium issue like these books that you see around the room, uh, we posted our articles online this year in a different format. Um, it's our new uh, online publication called SLR Online, Stanford Law Review Online. And you can see in sort of the, the black boxes up above that you can visit uh, Stanford Law Review Online, www.stanfordlawreview.org. Um, we are publishing six articles uh, this year, and uh, I'm excited to report that one of them has already been cross-published on Gizmodo, so feel free to, to check that out. Um, for those with laptops, if you're on Twitter, uh, our Twitter information is above. Uh, hashtag privacy paradox is what we're using for today's event, and our Twitter page is uh, at Stan Elrev. Um, a couple more words, uh, the MCLE forms, for those uh, who, are, who need MCLE credit, uh, at the end of the keynote, um, at, or at the end of the day, or, or you leave early, feel free to drop off the MCLE forms at the registration table uh, on your way out, just the evaluation form. The uh, certificate is for yours to keep for your records and you should have signed in, um, and that's how we will give you your credit. Um, bathrooms, ladies' bathrooms are located right outside, and men's downstairs on the first floor. And most of you should have received this, but if you're looking for the Wi-Fi uh, info, the network is Stanford, uh, the username is privacy, and the password is law school, and all of that is in lowercase. Um, so before we begin, I would like to say a special thank you to our programs group, Trish Gertridge, Aaron Lee, Jody Carrion, and Jackie Del Barrio, Barrio for all of their amazing work um, and their attention to detail. And also thank you to our director of facilities, Jillian Del Pozo, for accommodating our drones yesterday. Um, you could sort of imagine what that was like. Um, and also, our, we had a raccoon that tried to get our food yesterday, so she scared it off. <laughs> so thank you, Jillian, for your courage. Um, our, our, our AV team, uh, thank you to Sandra Schul and Joe Neto, and I don't believe they're here, but thank you so much for all your work. Um, and Elaine Adolfo and CIS, thank you for your design work. And our board members, John, Cheryl, Colin, Andrew, Laura, Harker, Steph, Adam, Rose, and James, thank you for all of your support and advice. And to, think, and to Stanford Law School, thank you, Dean Kramer and Julie Yee. And lastly, our sponsors this year, Sullivan and Cromwell and Double Boys and Plimpton. They're listed up above. Thank you for your generosity and support. So we turn to our first panel, Health and Medical Privacy. Uh, Professor Hayton Greeley will be moderating, and he'll introduce our panelists briefly. Uh, but Professor Greeley is the Dean F. and Kate Edelman Johnson Professor of Law and, prof and Professor by courtesy of genetics at Stanford University. He specializes in ethical, legal, and social issues arising from advances in the biosciences. He has written on issues arising from genetics, neuroscience, and human stem cell research, among other things. He chairs the California Advisory Committee on Human Stem Cell Research and the Steering Committee on the Stanford University for Biomedical Ethics and directs the Stanford Center for Law and the Biosciences. From 2007 to 2010, he was the co-director of the Law and Neuroscience Project, and in 2006, he was elected a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science. And with that, I give you Professor Greeley. Good morning. 
On February 6, 2000, 12 years minus three days ago, the Stanford Law Review held a symposium on privacy. I'm not actually sure that any of this year's people know that 12 years ago the Law Review held a symposium on privacy because that's four law school generations ago, uh, which is like in dog years a long time. Yeah. At that symposium, there was close to nothing about health law. There was a young, I'm not even sure whether he was an assistant professor or just a fellow, a, a bright young guy from Harvard who gave a talk about using some privacy protections about downloadable music and applying them to health information. I was asked to comment on him and I was afraid in retrospect that maybe I'd been a little harsh to him and maybe I'd sort of quashed his spirit. Uh, he was John Zittrain and I don't actually seem to have done any harm to Jonathan Zittrain's <laughs> self-image or ability to move forward with new information. I am very pleased that this symposium is actually starting with 90 minutes on health care because I think that the issues in health privacy are both somewhat different than issues in other areas of privacy. I think they are more concrete and direct and immediate to many of us. And I think they provide a nice, they are both a nice example of how different areas, how privacy looks different in different areas and they provide us nice grounding in the realities of privacy in an area that we care about a lot. Our plan of attack for this panel will be five very short presentations. Each of my speakers has promised faithfully to stay at five minutes. Although given that uh, one of them has to explain all of HIPAA, we thought maybe five and a half minutes for him. <laughs> As part of the less is more, short is good, I'm gonna give extremely brief introductions for each of the speakers, much briefer than Robert gave for me. Uh, you have full information on their backgrounds in the pamphlet for the, uh, for the conference and I refer you to that. But our speakers will be in the order in which they're going to speak. Kevin Milne, who is the Deputy Chief Counsel for De Region 9, the local uh, Western region of the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Civil Rights. Jeff Brown, who is a senior attorney in the Regulatory Affairs uh, branch of Microsoft. Devin McGraw, who is the director of the Health Privacy Project at the Center for Democracy and Technology. And Russ Altman. Russ has four different appointments at Stanford University probably the most interesting of which is chair of the Department of Bioengineering, although he is not an engineer. So we will talk about privacy issues. Everyone will speak briefly. Then we will discuss some of these amongst ourselves and then open it up to general audience comments. I do want to stress one thing. We will be talking about privacy in two different contexts here in the health world, both of which are important and require careful attention, but somewhat different treatment, I think at least. The clinical context, what your doctor's records and your hospital records say, and then research context, either new data created or generated or collected for research purposes, or clinical data being used for research. So keep your eyes on both those balls, clinical and research, as I'm sure our speakers will. Kevin, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Professor Greeley, for that very kind uh, introduction. I, uh, I have a feeling that um, you gave me extra time because I'm a Bolt grad and not a Stanford grad, and Bolt grads tend to be not as bright as Stanford grads and need more time to get their thoughts out. Um, so. You're a lot more humble than we are, though. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm very sure. I'm very pleased to be here. Um, uh, can you hear me now? Uh, okay. Very pleased to uh, be here to uh, talk to you about health information privacy in in the uh, healthcare arena. Uh, I, only, I have very few minutes to actually give you an overview of, of the uh, salient provisions of laws and regulations. So I'm going to try and move through it really quickly. If anything's not clear, please feel free to um, talk to me afterward or, or ask a question later on. Um, there are basically two federal laws or two laws in the healthcare in the federal system that regulate uh, health information privacy um, on the non-clinical side. That's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act of 1996, also known as HIPAA, and uh, a recent uh, piece of legislation called the High Tech Act. We'll talk a little bit about both of those, but we're going to focus mostly on HIPAA. 
Um, there are some research laws too. I'm going to touch on those briefly. We may talk about those more, uh, and probably will talk about those more uh, as as our uh, presentation uh, moves forward. Um, before I begin, though, um, the views here expressed are my own, and they are not to be attributed to the federal government or any federal agency, including the U.S. Department of Justice, the mm -hmm. Department of Health and Human Services, or the Office for Civil Rights. Um, after HIPAA was passed in 1996. HHS issued two rules to implement um, the administrative simplification provisions of HIPAA. Those rules are the privacy rule and the security rule. Uh, the privacy rule was promulgated first, the security rule was promulgated second. The privacy rule basically um, describes what kind of information is covered by the protections that HIPAA affords, who is governed by it, in, North, in other words, what persons and entities need to comply with HIPAA, and what kinds of uses can that information be put to? Basically, what uses and disclosures can be made of that information? How can information that's covered by HIPAA be used? The security rule focuses on technical, administrative, and, and physical safeguards to protect the security of electronic health information. So those are more technical, administrative, physical safeguards. We're going to talk, I think, more about um, uh, the privacy rule, not so much the security rule, but we'll definitely touch on both of those. Um, so basically, I want to sort of frame the discussion for you, or, or at least present it to you in three, in terms of three questions. When you're, when you're talking about HIPAA, um, I think it's important to keep in mind who is subject to the rule, who's covered by the privacy rule, what kind of information is protected by the privacy rule, and what does the privacy rule permit or allow to be done with the information that's subject to it? And we're going to walk through those three questions that sort of give you a context in which to place some of the later discussion. Who is covered by uh, the privacy rule? Um, the, the privacy rule covers both covered entities and business associates. Covered entities and business associates. Covered entities are health plans, health insurers, clearing houses, and, and certain kinds of healthcare providers, hospitals, physicians, laboratories that provide information in certain kinds of formats, electronic formats. The vast majority, for our purposes, let's just assume, it, it's safe to assume the vast majority of healthcare providers and insurers are covered entities. Um, federal programs are also covered entities. The Medicare program, the Medicaid program, the Indian Health Service are all, are all covered entities. That represents the universe of persons who are within the ambit of the privacy rule. Business associates are also now covered by the privacy rule. That's a change in the law, a recent change. Business associates are persons or organizations that provide services for covered entities. And they are not part of the covered entities uh, workforce, but provide services for them that involve the use or the need to use um, health information collected by the uh, covered entity. A common example, a medical transcription company that takes health information from a, from a physician and transcribes that. The transcriber can be a business associate. Um, the second issue or second question, what does HIPAA protect? Um, the privacy rule speaks in terms of protected health information, that's a term of art, um, we're going to unpackage that because it's a mouthful um, and, and there's some um, sort of terms of art within that that we need to sort of drill down to understand. Um, protected health information consists of th three things. Individually identifiable health information in any form or media, whether it's electronic, paper, or oral, held or transmitted by a covered entity or a business associate. Individually identifiable information in any form or media held or transmitted by a covered entity or a business associate. We talked a little bit about what a business associate is. We've talked about a covered entity. So let's focus a little bit on what it means to have individually identifiable health information. Um, individually identifiable health information is any information that relates to someone's physical or mental health or condition whether it's past, present, or future, or information about the provision of health care to the individual, or information about any payment for the provision of health care to the individual. So it's a very broad definition. And it has to be individually identifiable, not just health information, but individually identifiable. 
and the regulation uh, defines what that means. Individually identifiable health information is information that either identifies the individual or for which there is a reasonable basis to believe that it can be used to identify the individual. So certain identifiers um, are also, will also render health information um, personally identifiable or individually identifiable. And I have a feeling there's gonna be a lot of conversation about the adequacy of protections about whether, in the context of whether uh, information is sufficiently de-identified or identifiable and what kind of protection should be afforded to that kind of information. Um, many common forms of, uh, many common identifiers that you would not think are individually, would render in information individually identifiable can. For example, of course, name, address, birth, date of birth, or social security number, even telephone number. So it's important to think about this when uh, a lot of people think that the privacy rule only covers clinical or, or uh, diagnostic or treatment information. If your health care provider, in the course of treating you, collects your social security number, that becomes or can become protected health information that the covered entity or the business associate must then treat in accordance with the provisions of the, of the privacy rule. Um, so um, the privacy rule also establishes a minimum floor for the protection of health information. It's a federal law, it's, the min it's a minimum floor. States can have more stringent protection provisions. They're not necessarily preempted. We talked about, I wanna talk now about the last, um, wanna talk or address the last uh, question that I sort of raised in order to frame this discussion. If you have PAI and a protected health information and you've got a covered entity, what kinds of things can or cannot the covenant entity or the business associate do with that information. The general rule is that in order for a, um, uh, a covered entity to use or disclose protected health information, the covered entity must have either a written authorization from the person whose uh, health information it is to use or disclose that protected health information in order to, to use it or to disclose it or the use or disclosure by the covered entity must come within one of the exceptions to that rule which allows the covered entity to use or disclose that information without a written authorization from the person whose information it belongs to. Um, some of the more common exceptions or some of the more common uh, reasons or, or bases for which uh, protected health information can be used or disclosed without a written authorization involve treatment decisions, payment, or operations. So, for example, treatment. If, if uh, you're seeing a specialist and your general practitioner needs to send him information about your condition so he can evaluate you, your general practitioner doesn't need your written authorization necessarily to do that. If your insurance company wants to pay a bill submitted by your provider, uh, your provider doesn't need your authorization to submit that bill which contains your PHI to the insurance company that's gonna pay that bill. Um, some other uses or disclosures where authorization is not required is when uh, disclosure is required by law. There are certain public health activities where information can be used or disclosed and also to um, health oversight agencies. Um, I'm sort of running out of time a little bit, so why don't we just, um, uh, there are some other uh, provisions about research. Um, there are some federal laws, the common, uh, the common rule, and also some FDA uh, specific provisions that affect the use and disclosure of information in research. HIPAA does not supplant, the, uh, HIPAA, the privacy rule, and uh, um, does not supplant those requirements. Um, there are some enhanced penalties now under the High Tech Act for improper uses or disclosures, and I think that should do it, and I think I might have made it in six minutes. So thanks very much. If it wasn't clear, please feel free to um, um, speak up at the, um, at the mic when there's some time afterward. Thank thanks you. very much, Kevin. Jeff. Thanks. Kevin did a great job of explaining the, uh, the HIPAA requirements and the High Tech Act. I want to key off two things that Kevin mentioned. The first is HIPAA is not 
at its core a privacy law. Uh, and that's clear from the, the full title that Kevin said. It's the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act. And that word portability is important. I think it's, it shows that even back in 1996, or actually before that when the law was being drafted, there was already an, an understanding that there is a tension or perceived tension between being able to port data from place to place and privacy protections. And in fact, the portability came first. It was part of the Clinton era reforms that tried to allow individuals to control their data and move from health plan to another health plan, moving their data with them and not getting stuck in proprietary claim systems that the big health insurers were putting out at that time. And the privacy advocates, when they saw that the government was going to come in and make it easier to move data around, said we need privacy protections. Congress was unable, because I think they're constitutionally unable to enact privacy legislation, lowercase c, constitutionally. Uh, the, the, the Department of Health and Human Services uh, had to come in uh, and, and take the mandate that Congress gave them to issue rules. The second thing I want to key off of what Kevin said is that HIPAA has limited applicability. It, it is applicable to covered entities. The High Tech Act expanded that a bit. But in, if you're in this room, unless you're a doctor, you're probably not a covered entity under HIPAA. HIPAA does not apply directly to you. If you're Microsoft or you're Google or you're Facebook, HIPAA largely does not apply to you. It, it certainly didn't apply to you very much before the High Tech Act. And that was, and I'll give you an example of how that affected me and, and, and my client, Microsoft. I, I joined Microsoft, I rejoined Microsoft in 2007. I had been practicing for 10 years at a law firm, helping clients understand when they were covered and when they weren't covered under HIPAA, because many of my clients didn't want to be covered. They wanted to do their research without these rules. They wanted to be pharmaceutical companies and not deal with these. When I came to, to Microsoft, they were doing a, a new service called Health Vault, which lets individuals put their health records into uh, what, you know, the, the cloud, or more prosaically, on, into Microsoft data centers, where we format the data and make it more useful and allow you to, to transfer data from things like heart rate monitors and such like, and put that into a nice form. When we released that service, everybody was asking us, consumers and press alike, are you HIPAA compliant? And our answer had to be, the short answer had to be no. The long answer was, we're not covered by HIPAA. We can't make ourselves covered by HIPAA. And even if HIPAA did apply to us, it has so many provisions about health care that it's really hard for us to know how those would apply to us as a technology company doing something new that's really focused on the individual. And so for, for Microsoft, and I think this is true of, of many companies, when we look at what are our obligations to protect health information, we look not so much at HIPAA, but we look at what are the commitments that we've made to the users. And if you go out to the Health Fault site, uh, you'll find that we have a, a PHR data protection notice, uh, a notice that the Department of Health and Human Services worked on and published and we, we published a bunch of answers to questions like, do we share your data with anybody else? Do we let that data be used for research, et cetera? And the answers to those questions, and in our case is no, we, other companies could say something different. And then that's something that's out there publicly and we have to think about what would happen if we violated that promise. Would the FTC, Federal Trade Commission, have a claim against us under unfair and deceptive trade practices uh, riddles? Uh, would state attorneys general have that? We also have to worry, because HIPAA is not preemptive, about what do the states say? Uh, California has a rule against marketing off of health information. Texas has a new law about the requirements to disclose data. And so it, because HIPAA is not preemptive, and we don't have other uh, comprehensive privacy legislation in the United States, uh, we end up looking at these things very piecemeal. And as a result, I think that we have, as a country, not got a, a very clear idea of what can be done with data because there's so many different places where, as an attorney, you're advising a client, you have to look to figure out what the rules are. And to some extent, you have to think, what's the right rule when you're offering a service? And, and that's, that's, that's a challenge. Uh, and to be honest, Microsoft has been, for a long time, advocating for comprehensive privacy legislation. And we have around the world, uh, a lot of countries that have passed that kind of legislation, 
and we have to follow those rules over there in those countries, uh, we, we would like to have a similar situation in the U.S. We can talk more about that when we get to some of the specific examples. Thank you very much. Devin. Okay, great. Thank you. It's nice to be here. The Center for Democracy and Technology is a, a nonprofit uh, advocacy organization that's mostly located in Washington, D.C., but we actually do have uh, an office in San Francisco, and my colleague Kate Black, who works on health privacy issues in the state of California, is actually here as well. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about um, what makes working on health privacy bo both incredibly interesting but also immensely challenging. And I think a number of people who have spoken on this have touched on these issues. But it's, um, I actually do think HIPAA is a privacy rule. Whether it's a good privacy rule or not, we could debate. But it does set rules about how certain entities who are covered by it can access, use, and disclose data, a la fair information practices. And so that is sort of the essence of what many of us think is, is privacy. Now, it doesn't cover all health data. So it's not a privacy data protection law. But it is a privacy set of regulations. You won't find any of the meat of the privacy stuff in the statute. Jeff, and, and I don't, I agree that the HIPAA privacy rule is straight up privacy regulation, but the HIPAA statute itself yeah. is, was Yeah, water. don't go looking in the legislation for any of the details of what Kevin told you about earlier, because you really won't find them there. No. You gotta look, you gotta look in the regs. Um, it's, a, it's almost all regulatory, which creates some other interesting advocacy challenges, because you know, who, who, who's the most effective uh, body to push on when you, when you want to see changes? The administration, from a regulatory standpoint, has an enormous amount of authority to make some changes versus trying to move Congress, uh, which is often a lot more difficult. Um, not always, but most of the time, yes. So, so one of the challenges about doing health privacy work is that health data and the entities in the healthcare system, as well as those that are handling health data now that are sort of outside of the healthcare system, like the Microsofts and the, and the Facebooks uh, on occasion, is that healthcare is a business. And, yet, and so the data drives business, as well as driving a certain amount of public benefit through things like public health reporting and through medical research. And so the line that sometimes gets drawn by privacy advocates in other sectors where when is it for commercial gain and when is it more for the benefit of the consumer or classes of consumers is a lot harder to draw in the healthcare context because any given data flow usually, usually has a mixed purpose where there's somebody gaining commercially but the likelihood is, is that the public is gaining in some way as well. And so that makes it very hard to think about what are the set of rules that we create around data flows that, quite frankly, in a lot of contexts, we really need to be encouraging because we have a healthcare system that doesn't work very well and that costs us an awful lot of money. And yet, at the same time, people really do feel very, uh, very deeply about the sensitivity of their health information and how that is accessed, used, and disclosed, and who can have it. Uh, some people obviously care more than others, but you know we definitely do have a cross-section of the population for whom if we could not give them some reasonable assurances around how their rules around how their data is accessed, used, and disclosed, and some choices with respect to how it's shared, they would be very reluctant to seek health care and might not seek it at all or might not be completely truthful um, when they talk to their physicians. And we, we have some survey evidence about this. People not seeking cancer treatment because they're very afraid that those records are going to be in some way used um, against them or fall into someone's hands that it's really none of their, none of their business. So, and these issues, we've, got, we've made them a lot more complicated. They, they, were, they were already complicated when we had paper records. And now we are moving aggressively to get healthcare providers to adopt electronic medical records. Because digital data is much more useful, both from an individual treat, clinical treatment standpoint, but also from a research standpoint. Let's find out what treatments work, and let's disseminate that evidence and start driving healthcare to the things that work and that are, are the most cost effective, that, you know, best bang for the buck. 
um, you know, they're right now the, the, the U.S. has begun spending a lot of tax dollars to um, provide incentives for providers to adopt medical records, and yet we're relying on a set of privacy provisions at the federal, really, and state level that largely were crafted in a time where paper records were much more the norm. We haven't necessarily captured the new ways that data is being uh, shared or being able to be accessed. I mean, traditionally, if your record got shared by one healthcare provider with another, it meant that the healthcare provider you trusted made a decision to say, this is necessary for treatment and I'm gonna push this out the door, you know, whether it's by fax, by mail, or by pigeon, or maybe it never got sent at all, right? But now we're creating infrastructure where you can arrive at a, at a physician's office and ideally that physician doesn't need to know where else you went and what your healthcare history is because they can ping a, a patient registry and obtain the records that they need to treat you. Uh, and, and you may not even know that that happens, much less the, the uh, physicians who are holding your records know that those records have necessarily uh, been released or that they would make a decision uh, to release them. So it really changes the dynamic uh, in some really interesting ways um, that, that I hope we have a chance to talk about. The other issue that I think is really fascinating is the issue of sort of when is data identifiable, as Kevin raised, and when is it sufficiently at low risk of re-identification, we can never get it to zero, that we actually want to allow its use for a broad range of purposes. And there's been a lot of discussion, and the Supreme Court even touched on it a bit in the Sorrell case in the last term, about whether the de-identification standard is sufficient, whether we can regulate the actual uses of de-identified data, either in the name of privacy or in the name of reducing healthcare costs. Do we have the right set of rules to govern that? And then I think the third issue, which is always a hot button one in health privacy, and it continues to be uh, a contentious one, what is the role of giving people choices about how their information is shared in a healthcare context where there is a communitarian need uh, for data to be able to access and where giving people a right to sort of keep their data out of certain data streams uh, is something that we need to have a conversation with about, I think. On the other hand, people feel, feel very strongly about wanting to be asked when their information is being accessed, used, or disclosed for certain purposes, especially in the healthcare context. Great, thank you. I think your third point in particular is probably a good segue to Dr. Altman. Yeah, thanks very much for having me. And I'm uh, not a lawyer. I am not an engineer, evidently. Uh, I am. <laughs> Did I miss something? <laughs> I am a physician and an, informat <laughs> an informatician or computer scientist. And really, I think my job here is just to tell you a story that about a recent research uh, project that we did um, where we used multiple sources of information, uh, uh, health information, to come to a discovery that might be important for uh, public health, uh, but which involved five different kind of data bases. Uh, and I guess the moral of the story is we have to think hard about this because anything that's too much of a blunt instrument could really imperil our ability to do some amazing discovery. And of course, we also have to make sure that the privacy and security rights of people are respected. So. The first thing I want to mention and tell you is that the FDA does its best it can job at approving drugs, but it, it typically has to approve drugs when only a few thousand people have seen them. And when they go to the market then, millions of people may be exposed to them. And so drug side effects can emerge, and as you're all aware, in the, what they call the post-marketing period that were not at all obvious during the pre-market uh, evaluation. What's even worse than that is that many people are on many drugs and the FDA has no ability to prospectively evaluate the interactions, the potential interactions between two or more drugs to create side effects because they simply do not have statistical power in those initial studies. So it's only when we release those drugs out into the world that we can have any sense of what might be happening. So my students and I started a project. The FDA, re oh, sorry, this is the first data source, the FDA releases de-identified reports of adverse events every year. They've, re they've released literally more than two million over the last five or 10 years. Uh, they don't have any identifying information. What they do have are the diseases that the patient had, the drugs that the patient was on, their age, their sex, and the adverse events that they experienced. All of those except for age and sex are multiple, uh, multiple, multiple things. So we're interested in data mining, and my student looked at that data set 
and develop some somewhat sophisticated statistical algorithms to try to untangle all of the con kind of co confounding variables. But he came into my office and he said, Russ, I see a cholesterol drug and an antidepressant that seem to be increasing glucose. And this was Paxil or paroxetine, which is, which is used by 15 million Americans, and Pravastatin or Pravacol, which is used by 15 million Americans. And we estimated subsequently that about a million Americans are on both these drugs. So I looked at that and I said, well, if that's real, that could be a big deal. It was found from mining these adverse events databases. So we went to data source number two, which was the Stanford Electronic Medical Record, which has a mirror that's been de-identified for research purposes, a research data warehouse, if you will. We found 12 patients who we had enough data to evaluate what happened when they were on one of these drugs, had a glucose measurement, and then got the second drug, and then had another glucose measurement within a short enough time that we could really kind of make cause and effect uh, claims, and of all 12 of those had a bump in their glucose. So then I said, okay, wow, that's great, interesting, not publishable yet because it's an FDA discovery and then 11 patients, not going to fly. Called up friends at Data Source 3, the Vanderbilt, the Vanderbilt Data Warehouse, also for research purposes, and Data Source 4, the Harvard uh, data resource. I have friends there in the informatics field. I said, here's our preliminary data. If you guys can do this uh, as well, uh, it would be great. To make a long story short, we gathered between the three sites 160 patients, and there was a whopping increase in glucose for the patients on those two drugs. And patients with diabetes pre-existing had an even bigger bump. Therefore, uh, so, um, so that was the first four data sources, and we actually published a paper. We, sh we gave it to Matt mice sub subsequently, and the mice bumped their glucose. So this was a great story for us because there it was, the FDA data source, the three uh, data warehouses, um, and then we were making a discovery that really there was no way to make until you were watching millions of patients on these, um, on these drugs. I told this story to a friend of mine who works at Microsoft Research. Jeff just heard, this, just heard this story 10 minutes ago for the first time. He's at Microsoft Research and I said, we would love to look at search logs. I said, because I'm wondering if patients who are taking these two drugs are getting any kind of diabetes symptomatology that is making them go to the web like we all would if we're on drugs and we say, oh, I'm on this drug and I'm having a headache. And so I talked to my friend Eric Horvitz at Microsoft Research and they have a research database there uh, uh, from the Bing search logs. Bing is the Google competitor uh, uh, brought to you by Microsoft. And my favorite search engine because he was willing to do this and I had asked Google and they were not willing to do this. <laughs> And so I switched my default browser. My default search engine is in fact Bing on my cell phone right now. Um, what we did is we found that patients it, who searched for these two drugs, Paxil and Pravastatin, were more likely in the rest of the search to put words related to diabetes. Hyperglycemia, fatigue, weakness. There's a long list of words that you can kind of reasonably think might be related to diabetes. And they had a much higher rate of having those words after those two uh, drugs than patients who typed in one drug, like paroxetine, and then some other words, where they were not particularly associated with diabetes. So that's the fifth data source, and we are continuing to follow this up, and we're doing lots of research like this where we have many, many hypotheses about pairs of drugs that might be causing untoward effects. We're in discussions with the FDA about whether the label on these two drugs should be changed, and we're hoping that this will lead to public benefit. And so I'll stop here just to say that it is important to get all of this right, because it would be a shame if we couldn't do this uh, kind of research, or if doing this research in some way put people at some kind of risk that is not uh, fair or um, appropriate. So I think I'll stop there with that story. Thank you, Russ. So I think privacy is a really problematic word. It means way too many different things, and keeping those things straight can be difficult. I don't think of myself as a privacy expert. I work on bioscience research and health law. And yet there are a variety of those meanings of privacy that bump up against my work. I realized as I was thinking about this symposium that for me it's useful to make at least two distinctions and to think about confidentiality, the protection of data that has already been collected, as being different from privacy, what data gets collected, how you get watched. And so I want to start with that division and say first, I think confidentiality with respect to health data is largely toast. That electronic medical records make it so, 
I've been around health for about 25 years. For all that time, the electronic health record was five years in the future. In 1985, it was five years in the future. In 1995, it was five years in the future. But you know, now it's actually here in some places. My wife is a physician with Kaiser Permanente. She loves their electronic health record. She complains about aspects of it from time to time, but she thinks that it has made her enormously more productive and a higher quality doctor to be able to have that. It is tremendously useful material. It's also impossible to completely protect. Mm -hmm. HIPAA has some good aspects to it. I think it means well and it does some good things for many respects. HIPAA provides some penalties which only work if you catch somebody and you manage to enforce it. And it provides and it kills a lot of trees by requiring us all to sign another set of forms that we will never read. Apart from HIPAA, you've got problems with first mistakes. People lose laptops. People lose memory sticks. People put Stanford Emergency Room data on the web when they're a contractor who got that data for one purpose and thought, hey, this is a nice example of how to manipulate a large data set. And what, 20,000 people had their ER records on the web for over a year and nobody knew about it? People make mistakes. Second, sometimes people with authorization do things they shouldn't do. Nurses and doctors are interested in the medical chart of a celebrity or of their daughter's boyfriend or something else. <laughs> Third, sometimes unauthorized people get access. There are hackers. Fourth, even apart from all that, you've got some other authorized users, authorized by HIPAA and other things, such as law enforcement, civil court orders. So what happens in a few years when all of our genomes are in our clinical medical records and the police are interested in identifying somebody who's left DNA at a crime scene. That person isn't in the 10 million person CODIS database run by the FBI, but if it's a Northern California crime, there's a pretty good chance he's one of the four million, three and a half million Kaiser Permanente members whose genomes are in their medical database. Get a search warrant, get a subpoena, get something. The civil side of it is very similar. So there are authorized uses that people may not think about. And then finally, even if you de-identify with data as rich as health data, particularly when you add genomic data to it, de-identification is a myth. You can almost always re-identify somebody from their health data if you're willing to look hard enough. Certainly, Russ has been part of a team that showed with respect to SNPs, single nucleotide polymorphisms, it takes a handful yeah. to figure out who somebody is. Even with respect to health data, how many 27-year-old or people from 20 to 30, females from 20 to 30 who are a certain height and have cystic fibrosis live in Modoc County? Not very many. Now more live in Santa Clara County, but you begin to narrow things down. De-identification is a myth with a rich data set, and health information is already a rich data set, and it will only get richer. Is this a council of despair? Maybe. I think it says you can't promise people full protection. And I think we go too far toward letting people believe they have full protection now. What about privacy? That's a question of what data we let get collected. I think that's the interesting issue over which we may have some control right now. I look at things like the US v. Jones case involving GPS from the Supreme Court last week as that kind of what data do we allow to be collected question. In the health area, it could be things like having monitors on people that provide their health data to their doctor or some database that could be used very usefully, could also be used in pernicious ways. I think that's the frontier where we need to think hardest and where we have some ability to intervene, not so much to protect data that's already getting collected, but to decide what data should be collected in the future. And having ended on that cheerful note, Let's open it up to the panel first. I have, I think, two questions I want to pose to the panel before we open it up for audience questions. And the first one builds off my uh, recent rant. If a patient uh, were to ask you, how confidential is this health information I'm giving, uh, what would you say? Kevin. Um, a good lawyerly answer, it, it depends. Uh, Always the two words you should start an answer with. I, 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 agree, with, uh, I agree with much of what uh, Professor Greeley says. 
Um, there are, of course, um, instances where um, physicians or nurses look in records that they're not supposed to be looking in because they don't have a need to. They're snooping. Um, there are penalties for that. Um, there are mistakes. Mistakes do happen, and there can be penalties for that. Um, I guess what I'm, it, it's, there's a balance going on here that I think the privacy rule and, and these regulations try to address. We realize, or the government realizes, there are benefits to um, facilitating people's participation in the development of electronic systems that, that move information around. They're unlikely to do that if they don't feel there's adequate security and, and protections for their privacy. Um, it, uh, I think it's interesting to point out that um, HIPAA actually uh, the uh, administrative, administrative simplifi uh, simplification provisions within the statute did not prescribe um, any particular standards on uh, privacy or security, as, as Devin points out. They actually, Congress actually kind of punted to HHS and said, if, if Congress itself does not promulgate standards within three years of passing HIPAA, then it is the responsibility of HHS to do that. So HHS had to then, uh, with, when those three years passed, um, start doing the rulemaking process around this and build this system from the ground up. I was actually part of that process. Um, I actually worked on, the, on those rules when they were uh, initially promulgated. So I think um, there is this tension between how much protection um, is adequate, and it's always trying to find the right balance. Um, Rulemaking is a very flexible process as these issues um, arise, as, as an agency sees the need for, for maybe changing um, how this information is stored, used, and protected, they can respond to that. But there is this ongoing dynamic, this tension between protection and making it accessible for the uses that we're talking about today. So Kevin, let me push a little farther on that. I'm your nephew. And I'm about to go in for something. I'm thinking about getting some health care. And I ask, so you work on this stuff, Uncle Kevin. How safe is my medical information? It, it really depends. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, huh? I would say you'd have to weigh. It's, it's, it's as with every medical decision or treatment decision. It's similar to that. What's the risk and the benefit to providing that information that, in that particular encounter? If you're having um, brain surgery and the physician says, I really need this, well, I think I would probably give it um, if I want to come out on the other side with a successful outcome. Um, if, it's, if I'm going to uh, what they call the uh, dock in the box, um, you know, I've sprained my ankle and they want a whole uh, bunch of information about me, maybe not so much. So. I think, I think it is important for you all to be educated about what these, what these rules actually do provide and don't provide so that you can make intelligent decisions. Although I worry not so much about the people who've come to this conference, but the other 310 million Americans who are. I think Russ wants to jump in and then Devin. So, so I have had that question asked by patients in the clinic, and really what I would say is why do you ask? Because if they are about, because typically somebody might ask, they might not have any reason, it might be just pure, right. uh, but if they're saying, well, I'm about to apply for some life insurance, I would say you should leave my office right now. <laughs> I should not tell you anything about your risk for anything so you can answer honestly that you have not been diagnosed with anything. Yeah. And so leave, please. So, and, 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 and there's different advice you would give based on the exact situation. And, and, and it's a mess, and I think my colleagues know better than I that it's a mess, but it's clear that, um, it does depend, and I would just, go, and, and then as an advocate for the patient, I would just say, well, why are you asking, and what are you thinking about? You know, yeah. and I thought what you were getting to with the with the nephew scenario is, you know, what if they find some cannabis in my uh, urine test, and then I would say, again, many of these are, you should leave my office right now. <laughs> I mean, I think it's wrong to think about this as a, either it's absolute or it's nothing, right? I mean, how many areas of life can we give people absolute guarantees on anything? Uh, having said that, I do, I, I do think that there um, certainly are lots of ways that the public, that efforts to be more transparent uh, to the public about how their data is used, how it can be accessed, um, that we could do a much better job of being more transparent and educating people about this. Um, you know, when people throw around words like we're HIPAA compliant as though that means something and it actually, you know, is something that a consumer, for example, could hang their hat on, 
Um, it, I mean, it's, I wish I could tell people they should just stop using that term because I know better and I know it doesn't mean anything for the other 300,000 pe million people or I'm getting way off on the numbers. But I mean, it does, um, it, you know, you just can't do that. And, and I think ultimately the it depends answer is in fact the best you can do when you have an environment where the data flows are necessary to support certain critical aspects of the healthcare system, including your own individual care, much less the ways that the way you're cared for contributes to taking care of other people who are similarly situated. Um, you know, you just, that's a hard thing for people to grasp. But we don't give, we shouldn't be giving people absolute guarantees. It's, it's the wrong approach. And similarly, on the de-identification issue, it's interesting that the legal standard is not no risk of re-identification, and it never has been. It can't be. Of course, it, because it can't be, it's not possible. But in the law, we treat it like it has no risk, because we don't regulate it once it reaches that status. Well, it is interesting, the health sector is actually one of the areas where you can give people some guarantees. You will someday get die. injured, sick, and die. Yeah, <laughs> good point. That's about it, Jeff. If my nephew asked me, I would yes. say, why are you asking me? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, there's, there's two reasons. One is, but you're on this I, panel. I'm on this panel, and I suppose they're asking me because I'm an attorney, and they want to know what the law is. And I would say the law, or at least HIPAA, is out there. But it doesn't really affect how doctors will think about things in the moment. And it won't affect how a hacker is going to behave. If they're asking me because I have a technology background, I would have to agree with what you said, Hank, which is, there are ways to breach the security of most every system. And, and yet, what's really important is not what's the law and what's the technology, but is what's the culture of the place you're going to. And one of the things that I worry about with HIPAA and with any law is that the law has to map well to the culture of people who are actually using the data. And that uh, you, you've got to have people who know that they could reach in and get this data. But because they know it's, quote, the wrong thing to do, they don't do it. Because they made a promise to the patient, and they know that the patient is, is important, and that their livelihood depends on being uh, trustworthy with their patient, that they're going to do the right thing, even if the law is not looking, even if the technology allows bad use. Still in cultures, it's not always easy. No, it's not. But the, but the law can help if the law matches people's understanding. And I, I worry, and this is especially true when I see people ask about whether Microsoft products and services are HIPAA compliant, does the law really map to what people are asking about? Because as we just talked about, I don't think it always does. Yeah. I want to go back to Russ on a little point. So Kevin, you said it depends if you have a sprained ankle and go to a doc in the box, you might not talk about your whole health history. Russ, can you come up with a hypothetical where somebody with a sprained ankle and the doc in the box might actually need to tell the doc something? Like hemophilia history or clotting disorders? Of yeah, I mean, even a, we, we, I mean, we're calling them doc in the box because for these weird Sounds good. for these weird reasons. But really, if they're they're probably a physician who takes their job seriously and wants to do the best job, and so they need to take a, a complete history, at least complete enough to make decisions about drug prescribing, about any kind of intervention that they might want to do, sutures, anything. Uh, and they might also be asking about insurance and ability to pay, or at least the front desk will be asking that. Yeah. Um, uh, so so it's, it's, it's very hard to contain the information that a physician might find relevant. Uh, in a few years, they'll be asking about the availability of genetic information to make the best prescription about pain reliever. Um, some people will not respond to codeine at all, and soon it will be malpractice to prescribe codeine to somebody who you know it, does, it won't work on. So in a few years, the, the genetics might be even relevant at the Walmart doc in the box. Or that it works too well. Or it works too well. <laughs> so let me shift to research uh, issues for a second, and I guess I'll start with you, Russ, because I think this is what you're most interested in here. There is a public good from having our data available for research. People are antsy about having their data accessible too broadly. Where do you think we should draw the line in terms of making research, clinical data available for research, particularly in a context where re-identification can't be ruled out? 
Yeah, so we've looked very carefully, and I'm not optimistic that technical means for guaranteeing privacy will work. So I think it is social means. I think it's people like the people here who need to set up uh, the boundaries, so to speak. Um, I can tell you that I am very bullish on the possibility of really improving healthcare substantially with pooled electronic medical records at the regional, state, and even national level. We did a little mini one of that with uh, Vanderbilt, Harvard, and Stanford. But for some questions, those three sites are not good enough. We've talked to Kaiser Northern California, so we've kind of gotten, begun to get that. So I think that that's extremely valuable for discovery. Um, and I understand people's worries about privacy. Uh, a lot of it is a direct function of the way healthcare works in the United States. People in France are not worried about health privacy nearly as much. Because if you find out something bad about their health, it doesn't mean that they're not going to be insured. Whereas if you find or predict something bad about your health in America, and if I, as your physician, tell you about that risk, and therefore you have to disclose it on your next insurance application, that has much bigger consequences. So, so I'm, a, I'm a bullish on what it can do in terms of discovery, and I am re regretful that, um, that it's a, a particularly difficult situation in the current health uh, reimbursement climate. I think the France example is a nice one, and it ties in with something Jeff said about cultures. It's not just health insurance in the insurance world, but different cultures have different cultures of privacy and confidentiality. I was blown away years ago doing some work on Iceland to discover that in Iceland, tax returns are public information. And you can go online and check out the tax return of anybody you know in Iceland. Um, I can't imagine that happening here, and yet they're quite happy with it. And the Scandinavian countries in general are quite good about medical data. Uh, being allowed for research uses. I just want to add two things I wanted to say was, uh, this is obviously changing if you have ever met a teenager. Uh, their ability and willingness to share data, and that may evolve, but it may not. In other words, we all think they might be in a phase. We know in many ways they are in phases. Uh, but they're, but it's not clear how that's going to evolve. But, but, and I think evidence that it may not go away are these companies like patients like me that are getting many people with diseases to sign up and share unbelievable amounts of private information willingly with people who have other, the same disease or who are also suffering and the benefits that they get make that equation for them an easy one. So there's a very interesting sea change happening that is very hard to read uh, the future but I, I, I don't think it's ir um, ridiculous to imagine that these views in, in our culture will change greatly in the next. Just to drop a footnote on Utes and their views of yeah. privacy, um, I, don't, I, I agree with you. I don't know where it's going to go. But I think sometimes we overstate just how non-privacy oriented they are. Yeah. When my kids found out their grandmother was on Facebook, they went through an incredible scramble to rearrange what was available to whom. <laughs> because there's just a lot of stuff on Facebook they were happy to have their friends see, but not their grandmothers. Yes. Devin, you have thoughts on research? Yeah, I mean, I, I actually um, think Russ really put his finger on it, which is to say that, you know, the, and the example that he gave could not have been more perfect in terms of demonstrating the enormous value um, of aggregate data sets. And we, you know, I, I think the current law tries to provide some answers for ways to make sure that that data can be made available while also understanding its, its level of, sen of sensitivity, you know, uh, and some of the more recent projects that I've been involved with along similar lines as to yours, including the Mini Sentinel project, which is an FDA post-market surveillance initiative, which involves um, collecting data uh, about to look for safety signals of drugs. Th there are definitely sort of privacy and, and confidentiality enhancing ways to do it. Uh, for example, using keeping data in its home, but figuring out a way to uh, have the, the analyses run, they call it bringing questions to the data, so you're not making yet another copy of the data for every single important question that you want to answer, creating yet another database that could be vulnerable to hacking, and then, you know, hoping, whoa, everybody okay? <laughs> and then hoping that it doesn't get hacked. So there's, uh, so there. We need an engineer. Yeah. <laughs> But not a bioengineer. 
Oh boy. I think we broke it. I think I broke it. Folks, I don't think this is my fault. <laughs> but I'm probably wrong. <laughs> we have all these law review books you can use to prop it up. You know, that's what's heavy. I think you should take those off. <laughs> <laughs> Having carried those around in a backpack not all that long ago, we should definitely take these off the table. Well, ignore the people behind the screen. Go ahead, Devin. <laughs> no, well, I mean, you know, I th again, it's never going to give people absolute guarantees, but to the extent that we can reduce the identifiability of data so that you're dealing with researchers who don't really care to know who the individual people are, but who really want to ask the questions, uh, it, you're capable of doing so, but providing some measure of confidentiality to the persons whose data is involved. And then I think the, the bigger and tougher question to get at is who decides what projects get done, research projects? Who makes those decisions and to what extent are they sort of accountable to the public in some way for the decisions that they make? And to me, that's um, the toughest question because right now we typically de have those decisions made by things called institutional review boards within institutions but whether that results in uh, the right decisions being made, whether the public would agree that the right decisions are being made or whether in fact those IRBs serve as obstacles to important research are a set of questions that we have grappled with historically, but that we really do need to focus on and deal with in a much more productive way as we continue to enrich data sources that are much more valuable from a research standpoint. Jeff? I, my biggest concern is that the health law area will go off in its own direction. Mm -hmm. And I think this is a subset of the big data discussion that we're going to yeah. have this yeah. afternoon. Yeah. Uh, and, and people are going to have expectations about how big data works. In the past, people, when they gave data to somebody, they understood that transaction, and they gave consent, they understood what the data was going to be used for, and that was enough. And now we're having to move from that sort of transactional viewpoint to this idea that there's big data out there about many, many people. You can't go back to everybody whose data is in these databases and get their consent for something new. So you have to come up with some sort of a, a social understanding of what proper uses are for that data and what the obligations are on those uses. Yeah. And I do think that there's a lot of work that's been done in medical health privacy over the past however many years with IRBs and with medical research rules. But that has to be plugged into the, the broader discussion because real people, the 310 million who aren't here, don't have time to think about all these issues. They need to have a very simple understanding about what's right in this new world of big data. I wonder to what extent it will be, if health will be an exception and treated differently. I am in some areas a health exceptionalist and I think people care about their health data so much more than they care about some other data, whether they should or not, frankly. There's nothing very interesting. My health data will tell you my doctors think I should lose weight. Um, People care about it more, and it's also sort of inherently harder to divorce from identifiability because it's so much data about your physical being and body. And whether we'll have special rules for health or not, I'm, I'm agnostic on But where do we draw the line? Because Russ pointed to the Bing data set, yeah. uh, which yeah. we don't think of Bing data set as being health data. But. Yeah. Kevin, any thoughts? Uh, yeah, there's, there's a, a lot of great ideas around here. Um, floating around, I, I, I'm thinking of a, something that my father used to say, locks are made for honest people. Hmm. And I think in terms of some of the issues that we're talking about here in terms of privacy, we do assume that, um, it, it, that people will respect boundaries and limits that are placed on the use of data, just like we expect that they will um, respect the limits that we place on lots of other things, like access to one's house, access to one's personal property. Um, the, other, the other thought is I want to talk on, uh, just touch on something that uh, Dr. Altman mentioned. Um, under the Affordable Care Act, as it, as it moves towards um, full implementation, um, by 2014, the ability of insurers to um, discriminate or to refuse coverage to persons on the basis of health status will, um, will drop significantly, which may help re uh, diminish some of the sensitivity that people have around 
healthcare information and whether or not they can be stigmatized by it, whether or not they can be denied insurance coverage be because of it. So that might, that might be something that one of the benefits of healthcare reform will be that as well. Although I do believe that like GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act, it covers health insurance, not life. disability, long-term care, or life. Right. GINA, and GINA is uh, specific only to genetic Genetics. information. Healthcare reform will uh, broaden the uh, protections that people have for all sorts of pre-existing conditions. But still just for health insurance. Right? right, just for health insurance. So there is this other area of liability coverage um, uh, that, that is outside of the scope of the um, Health Care Reform Act. Okay. Well, let me invite you to uh, ask questions. We've got microphones up here. While you're wandering down, I would just note one thing about research. We talked about confidentiality with respect to research and the extent to which confidential information should be used for research. There are also some privacy, what information should be collected in some kinds of research. One of the daunting things about some research, like uh, xenotransplants, for example, putting non-human organs into humans is how long would you want to follow those people? Probably for the rest of yeah, their lives. Yeah, yeah. You're signing up to be closely monitored as a research subject for the rest of your life. And that's sort of, a, on my view, the privacy side, what data gets collected. And that can cause some problems for folks. So let's start on this side. Oh, hi. Um, I was actually just hoping to ask the panelists about an issue that I've seen in the news over the last couple of years. And that's the use of newborn screening samples for research purposes without getting the consent of the parents. Um, and just by way of background, in case not everyone's followed this issue, it appears that essentially all newborns have blood samples taken from them at birth to test for certain genetic conditions. It used to be that those samples were then disposed of, but today they're increasingly held on to. And I guess the problem arises because um, states don't necessarily obtain consent from parents to use those samples from research purposes. Um, and some parents end up objecting quite strenuously when they find out that they're being handed over for research. Um, I was just wondering if the panelists have any thoughts on this. Do we, I just don't even know, is this information covered by HIPAA? Do we think that a DNA sample can ever be considered DNA, uh, you know, unidentified or de-identified? Um, and also, has anyone devoted any thinking to whether there's a, there's a Fourth Amendment problem? If the government um, mandates that a DNA sample be taken, doesn't get consent for it to be used for research purposes, and then hands it over to researchers to examine in the course of an investigation. Who's first on this one? Um, I can just say technically, I, um, I am aware of that, and many of my colleagues are extremely excited about getting access to that data. <laughs> Shock. Just being honest. Um, and just to say that many times those were not thrown out, but they were kept in file cards of the actual, these are the pinpricks and the heel of your child when they're born. So, um, but even I am aware of efforts to go back to those little cards and extract the DNA from even many years ago from those cards, just to kind of embellish the issue that you've raised. Um, Devin, then Kevin. OK. Uh, Kevin can address whether they're covered by HIPAA. I think they're probably not, depending on who's collecting them. But, e but even if they were, I mean, it's a huge controversy. Um, and it's a big example of what can happen if you're not transparent with the public about a data collection activity that probably started fairly innocently, which is we're going to test for inheritable disorders from a public health standpoint. Mm -hmm. um, but then if they didn't destroy the samples immediately, they came to realize that there was some additional research value to this. And so they started to make them available for research purposes. And then, of course, long after the fact, parents find out about it. Anytime you're dealing with kids, you know, it's, the com it's a constellation of issues that um, uh, could have a very bad result. And I know that in the state of Texas, because they could not resolve it, there's no way to go back and get really get the consent of all, the, uh, all of the parents to use of the blood samples going forward. Uh, they had to destroy them. And I think there were probably researchers who cried buckets over that one. But it, at the end of the day, because it was handled so poorly from the beginning, there was probably no other way that that could have been resolved. Um, one, you know, consent becomes the sort of linchpin that the articles focus on. We need to get the consent of the parents, but I'm not sure how much you gain from a privacy and confidentiality standpoint from being able to ask, be asked for a general consent to subsequent research use of data without any more specifics, which you can never get on the front end because 
ultimately what's valuable from a research question in 1964 when I was born is not going to be as interesting as the questions that are swirling around today and a general consent like that I think most privacy scholars would find to be fairly deficient and so while it might satisfy the from a policy standpoint well at least we've asked at the end of the day if you're putting the uses of that data to something that is publicly objectionable either at large or to certain subsets you're still going to be in trouble for doing it I don't know that everybody anybody's assessed it from a fourth amendment challenge because certainly the initial collection is probably hinges on public health uses which you know the public health uh, power is fairly significant right the state and federal level, but whether then you sort of cross the line when you uh, when you allow that data to be used for subsequent purposes mm -hmm. without Actually, whether it's consent or some other sort of, of rules around that and some public transparency and ability for the public to. Be, have input into those decisions. Yeah, I think I think Devin actually kind of nailed it. Actually, there's two different kinds of consents going on here. Actually, in many states, I think in almost fifth, in almost every state, some form of um, screening is required at birth, so right. the parent cannot object to it. Except in some yeah. instances, they can object on religious grounds, but for the most part, they're required tests. That's different. Consent to that is different from consent to <coughs> using that information then for research. And research is actually something that's defined in the regulation as. Um, the use of information for uh, generalizable studies in order to, your ta that, that is research and it's different, they, the rule differentiates um, research from treatment. Um, so the issue really comes down to, um, well there's a couple of issues. First of all, the collection of the data itself is a user disclosure of protected health information and if it constitutes research, um, the collector of that data, if it's a covered entity, would, would have to have some sort of authorization or permission to use that information in research. So there might be an issue of just whether or not they've got valid. If it's personally but it's, identifiable. But, it's, but, it's, but, right, it's but, identifiable. It's, but if it's in the hands of a public health agency, I'm. I'm Oh, very true, but I mean, yeah. a lot of times it's the covered entity that's. It, well, they they're they're the ones who collect it in the first place. Exactly. They give it to the public health authority under public under the statute. Right. It's out of their hands. So different Assuming they don't keep it. Right. <laughs> Assuming they don't keep it. Right. Different states do different things. Some states destroy them quickly. Some states keep them forever. Texas destroyed four and a half million of these spots as a result of litigation, which led to a statute which now requires an asking for consent for research uses, though not consent for the actual public health right. testing. There's a lawsuit in Minnesota ongoing. And on yeah. the Fourth Amendment question, a former fellow at our Center for Law and Biosciences Kelly Lowenberg just published a piece in the Cincinnati Law Review this past year, 2011, on, I can't remember the title of it, but it's about fourth, possible Fourth Amendment limitations on searching DNA that you've collected for one purpose, but searching it for another purpose. It's a really complicated issue. I don't think there's a clear answer, but it's a really good article. We've now taken about uh, yeah, nine minutes in the first question. That was a good one. <laughs> so the question was short. The answers maybe we need to work on a little bit. Over here. About absolute law, when a Stanford professor who is a Muslim was asked, what is Sharia law? He said, it is whatever the local magistrate says it is. I think Obamacare should be called insurance company care because they had the most input. The question is, what do you believe are the main causes, or what makes a person culpable for not taking care of their own health? That's the main reason I think that people don't want their um, medical records put out, because of the blame that might be associated with it. So, so it, it's, it, it's hard to decide whether when a person does something that's injurious to their own health, whether it is their own free choice or whether it is the background and situation that they're in in which anybody else would have made the same mistake. So you've asked a very big question about the degree of responsibility somebody bears for their own ill health, which is a huge question that I think goes far beyond this symposium. The part of it dealing with privacy is the idea that maybe people are worried about their health care privacy for fear that they will get blamed for medical conditions that they cause. My own guess, for which I have no empirical data, is that's a very limited reason. Some people might feel that way, but most people are just, they, 
they don't want other people looking at their health records because yeah. they don't know what might be in there. And a small percentage, but a non-trivial percentage, will have something in there that they know will be stigmatizing, like you know, drug addiction treatment, or uh, in some states, for some women, a uh, history of abortion, uh, things that they think would cause them difficulty. So I, right. it's potential, but I don't think that's likely to be a major problem empirically. We're here. Um, I work for a uh, web-based electronic health record company, um, and I'm interested in if you think that uh, standards for research should differ if, the, if that research is conducted in an academic setting or data from a nonprofit hospital versus within a company. Personally, I don't. The common rule only applies to entities that are either the government or taking money from the government or have a particular association with the government or uh, involved in an FDA permitted uh, setting. So it doesn't involve other kinds of research. I would like to see human research regulations expanded to cover all human subjects research. Uh, I think that will happen um, maybe before health freeze is over, but not a lot before health freeze is over. I, I, you know, so you're a bit, you're a, your company is probably a business associate to the providers whose records you hold, and so there are some HIPAA research rules that Kevin alluded to earlier, which are similar to, but not the same as the common rule. I, I do think um, that people probably think that there are some cultural norms associated with research in an academic setting that it's not entirely clear will be replicated in, in the context of a vendor setting. But you all are collecting a lot of really good, important data. So my own sense is that you know if you want to contribute to the research enterprise, that there ought to be some parameters around that. But I wouldn't want to discourage it if it's similarly done in the public good. But how, how do we decide that? Do you just get to decide it? Or is there some sort of process for vetting that? And I'd also note there's a dynamic going on in the research world of translation. Translation is the current hot buzzword. Move things from the bench to the bedside, translate them into activity. And so NIH and D D HHS is eager to let pharma and biotech and other companies that are interested and are crucial players in bringing technologies to actually help people interested in making sure they get access to data that they can use for it, but people who sign up for an academic research study may not realize that ultimately non uh, for-profit companies uh, are likely to have access to that as either required or arm-twisted by NIH. Over here. Yeah. Uh, Peter Swire, Ohio State University, and for better or worse, I was the White House coordinator for the proposed and final HIPAA privacy rules. So. <laughs> Um, lots of people have thrown things at me at different conferences. Um, the, um, the simplest reason for it, just briefly, is that um, the HIPAA statute said all payments had to be in electronic form. And if you're going to start any payment that came from the federal government, which is something like half the dollars. So if you're going to be shipping electronic records all over the country with no privacy and security standards, that's a problem. And so the privacy and security rules came in because there seemed to be some need for some structure around that. Um, what I wanted to ask about is, is or talk about is to push back on Hank's uh, quote that de-identification is a myth um, in, in the following way. There's a, a whole debate in the academy about how easy it is to de-identify. Paul Ohm and others uh, and some of the European regulators basically think de-identification is so flimsy that everything should be fully regulated as protected information. And in, in fact, it takes a lot of work and detective work to re-identify in a lot of settings and is probabilistic. If you were to go the Paul Ohm or European regulator route, Russ's research is forbidden. And so I think where Devin has been in her own work on de-identification, on, on you know, reports on it, and what Russ was saying about sort of institutional controls rather than technical controls, gives us a way to have a bunch of the research go forward without the full panoply of breaking it down and, and saying it's all regulated. And, and to say it's a myth because eventually somebody can batter their way into any house, <laughs> I think overstates it a lot and leads to some really bad effects. So, well, first, the idea that everything can be could be re-identified doesn't necessarily entail any particular regulatory stance with respect to that. It does under a bunch of laws that say identifiable triggers a right. bunch of legal but consequences. It, it, it doesn't in my in, as I'm looking at this, and we're not in Europe, um, so we're not under the European statutes at this point. Second, I think at least in the context of health data. You may, be under, you may be overestimating how difficult it is to re-identify people if you've got access to 
a broad, rich clinical database because there's a lot of information in that. The, the classic example of this, the beautiful example, is Latanya Sweeney. Uh, Governor Weld, this is that long ago, maybe 15 years in Massachusetts, said we'll make available all Medicaid and government employee health records for research. Don't worry, it'll all be de-identified. We'll take all your identifiers off. I think three days later, she delivered Governor Weld's health records to both the governor and the newspapers, <laughs> using just the DMV database, the voter registration database, and that information itself. But all of her, all of her strong results came by having date of birth. So gender, you have roughly two options. Right. Date of birth is 366 times 80 years, 25,000 cells, and date of birth is not allowed to be used under HIPAA and still have it de-identified. De right, date of birth is not allowed to be used under HIPAA and still have it be de-identified. It doesn't necessarily fall over into the common rule if it's a non-HIPAA protected research. And if you get access to health records directly that haven't been called de-identified, you've got date of birth. Even without date of birth, once you get into genetic information and begin to cross-link genetic information, um, I, think, uh, I think it is not, if you've got the full record short of names, et cetera, if you've got date of birth, it's easier. Even without date of birth, you can't make any guarantees. It's not going to be that difficult. And with genetic information, it gets, it's just going to get easier and easier. So we may have an empirical disagreement on the difficulty of it. I think we both can agree that you cannot tell people re-identification is impossible. What's, I mean, with enough work, you can find almost anything. Yeah. That's really not the but, standard, but so, as Debbie said under the And that book. comes back to what we said to, to the discussion of the first question about is it, what do people think? What does the general public believe their level of security is? I'm afraid the general public believes their level of security is a lot higher than it actually is. That could lead to a backlash when they discover that it's not higher. On the other hand, telling them that it's not as high as they think it is could lead to some bad effects, too. But I think right now we're in a setting where people think health information, boy, that's really protected. But uh, and it's not. There's a continuum of risk. So if I have people's names and all of the details, and that data gets out, it's an immediate risk to the patient. Yeah. If I have the somewhat de-identified data that could be re-identified, not the same risk. And I think the, to Peter's point, we need regulations that scale based on the risk. Yeah. And uh, I, I, don't, I don't disagree with it. In fact, I'll be stronger. I won't be lawyerly. I won't use the double negative. I actually agree with that. But I do worry that the general public doesn't understand any of this scale stuff. They think yeah. health records, it's confidential. It's, Marcus Welby would never release anything. <laughs> well, but, but, and, and that sets up a potential for bad <laughs> be paid. effects. But researchers and companies have an obligation to do the right thing so that people don't have to have that conversation with 310 million Americans talking about it. They should just know that the right thing has been done and that we're treating the data correctly. At least that's the way that, you know, corporate speak, we think about it. Over here. Uh, one comment on that. My favorite line from a researcher recently, and I'm a lawyer who supports transactions like Dr. Altman does, is can I have a de-identified limited data set for all the hippie geeks in the room? You'll know why that's funny. <laughs> but my question is, actually, um, I would appreciate some commentary. I read a provocative article on my way down here about unique patient identifiers. And um, the two, you know, so counterpoint perspectives, one person said, a unique patient identifier assigned nationally that was not your social security number would actually give patients more control because it, it's through that patient identifier that that control would be asserted in a technical format. And I know from researchers that it would allow them to do their research better, but I'd be interested in the panel's take on you know, those two points of view and what's being missed in that conversation or why are we so afraid to have a conversation about a unique patient identifier. Anyone take? Sure. So I, I think the biggest problem with the conversations to date around a unique patient identifier is that it's being positioned as the single answer and that it alone will solve the problem of being able to match patients accurately to their data. And the fact is, is that it's another data field. And it's no more less likely to be transposed or written down wrong than any other data field, and it's no more likely to be protected from people wanting to use it for other purposes than the social security number has been, which was originally designed to facilitate your ability to get social security benefits, and now it's ubiquitously used. And so it's going to be very hard once you sort of establish yet another national number 
um, to be able to prevent its use for other purposes that are gonna, then going to destroy its utility for the healthcare sense. We need to fix the matching problem. Um, but I think you buy yourself, and this is just a political reality, you buy yourself a lot of constituencies that pay absolutely no attention to the healthcare conversation when you talk about giving people a unique, every, requiring everyone in the country to have a unique number. We need to be able to progress on this way sooner than we would be able to resolve the debates around that issue. Yes. Hi. Um, my name is Nusrat Khalili, and my question, A louder, please. my question is, what are the penalties if you're, you don't comply as a covered entity, you don't comply with the use and disclosure requirements? I think I know who that goes to. Yeah. Well, under, under the High Tech Act, those penalties are enhanced. Um, covered entities um, that don't comply or that uh, fail to comply with the privacy provisions are subject to civil money penalties. They're significantly enhanced. Uh, they may not be as high as some privacy advocates would like. Uh, there's a cap um, per year. Uh, if, if, a, if a covered entity violates the same standard numerous times in the same year, they can only be liable for $1.5 million. But there are also criminal penalties, actually, sanctions against um, the individuals who, the individuals who um, you know, misuse protected health information. So we're at our time, but we started late and we have two questions left. So if we can have short questions and even more difficult, at least for me, short answers, uh, we'll get you out to lunch. It's Josh Cooperman, local um, uh, financial advisor. Um, two, two items. First of all, my wife's a health professional, and when you talk about electronic health records, um, it's a little bit outside the scope of this conference, but I think you're going to need to have some kind of uh, uh, antitrust view because there are two, two or three very large companies and it turns out the way there it's working it's almost becoming one and I'm it's outside the scope of this conference but I think what you need to do is force those companies to be able to cross match data so a, a one hospital chain can give information for instance Sutter can give information to Kaiser if they're on different vendors which is not, not subject to this conference. But they're actually, I think, they're on the, on the same, same vendor. vendor, but they still can't <laughs> well, talk very well. It's like that, Epic that, is a Romance language, but it might be Romanian or Portuguese or French. <laughs> and my wife dealt with the implementation oh, yeah. at her hospital, and it pretty, was pretty bad. Yeah. Yeah. The, the thing about, for this conference, is my wife's a health professional, um, a specialist, and she will not give certain information to her internist for mm -hmm. fear that it will go in the file for insurance purposes. My question to you is, should, and, and with the genome issues, could you be, you know, as a condition of getting insurance, could you be forced now to give an insurance company this type of information or be forced to give a sample which they can then? Shouldn't there be some law, national law, or at least state law in California, which is a little bit more, quote, liberal or more, more amenable to privacy issues, a privilege? which uh, a, an attorney, a defense attorney or insurance company attorney would not be able to breach. So you wouldn't feel a, 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 a defensive when you're going to your healthcare professional. You wouldn't, you, know, you wouldn't feel that you can't tell them everything for fear it gets written in the record. Well, I think there already is a, there already is a privilege for communications between an attorney, I'm sorry, between a medical professional and, and the patient. Um, so I, I, maybe I don't understand. Yeah, but a lot question. of times you have to give that up when you're applying for insurance. So uh, you have to waive it. I mean, I'm, I'm talking about where you would be able. There would be certain information, such as your genome issues, which would not be waivable. So I think there are two different approaches to dealing with this. One is to try to, if you're worried that an entity is going to misuse information about you, one thing to do is to try to keep the entity from getting that information. The other one is to try to forbid them from using it in bad ways against you. Um, in the insurance context, the Health Reform Act will make, at least on the health insurance side, it much harder for it to be used against you. And right. frankly, I think that's probably the more uh, plausible route to go, try to limit what bad things can be done rather than try to limit the data that they get, because there are some good reasons mm -hmm. for insurers and others to know a fair amount about your health. If they can't discriminate against you on that basis, that does cause some problems for some insurers. And those are real problems. They're not just venal problems. But um, 
that does, if we limit the extent they can use it against you, I think that solves some of, a significant chunk of the problem. Last question. Thanks for your patience if this is the last question. Um, you've acknowledged that most of the legislation in this area boils down to agency rulemaking, but privacy is about sort of community and individual norms and expectations. Outside of this room, most people don't read notices of proposed rulemaking from HHS and CMS. So what ideas do you have for meaningful public participation and conversation around getting people into this debate and going forward making rules that everybody knows about? Well, actually, well, I, I, it's a valid point. Um, there were actually 52,000 um, comments submitted on the privacy rule, at least the first round of it. Um, again, I can only tell you that Congress delegated this responsibility to the agency. I don't know what the solution is. Congress did not itself want to set out the standards, and maybe that was probably a good thing. I mean, it's hard to address. Imagine the, the full Congress trying to think of all of the um, situations or concerns that were raised in the 52,000 comments that were submitted by by the public. So I, I don't know if there I don't know if there is a better way to engage the public in participation in rulemaking. Um, you know, that's just the function of way our, our, our regulatory framework works. But in terms of education, uh, maybe other folks on the panel have yeah. that, have ideas for that. Good. So let's take that broader, David. Yeah, and, and, and there are also consumer organizations. They're not perfect proxies for individuals weighing in, but that's what they consider their job to be: is to try to represent the public voice. We're not always do it. We do our best, but. Uh, acknowledge that others don't. Uh, but but what's probably more important is that the, the rules set guardrails, which are important to people, but at the end of the day, what an institution in your community actually does with its own internal policies and practices and the decisions that they make about how they'll make data available for research purposes, for example, um, are probably a much more um, viable place for the people in that community to get involved and, and to be influential. And it gets to the issue of sort of transparency that I talked about and what's the most effective way to reach the public on these issues. And I'm not sure, I mean, the rulemaking process is what it is, and I wish I could come up with a great idea for ways for people to be more involved in that. They're, they're written in highly legal language. They're often hard even for those of us who are lawyers to understand. So to me, it's sort of what does it mean you know, sort of boots on the ground. What does it mean in terms of the institutions in your community who need to be responsible to their constituencies in terms of how they're going to take those rules and then operate within them? Because there's lots of room for discretion. Lots of room for discretion. And that, to me, is a much more viable way for the public to have some input about what's going on in their own community. And most people get care in their own community, not, you know, not outside. To me, what your question raises is, I think, the most important issue here, and that is getting the public to understand better what the limits are on the confidentiality of their health information and what the trade-offs are and why there are good reasons that even if we could guarantee 100 percent confidentiality, it would be a bad idea. Get the public to understand that better, and I think it lowers the risk of a catastrophic meltdown when people discover as a result of a scandal or a loss that what they thought was their protected right actually isn't, which could in turn prompt a backlash that could harm research, clinical medicine, and the public good more broadly. So um, I think the education issue goes far, and, and, uh, goes far beyond uh, rulemaking. Well, thank you for being so patient. We've taken you seven minutes into lunch. Uh, yes, thank you so much to our panel.